Hi, AJ Hartley here, novelist, Shakespeare professor, um, fan of various things, Japanese music included. Minasan konnichiwa. Ja, so, um, I don't know. What, what am I doing today? Uh, well, um, it's been a while since I talked about Atarashi Gakko, and, um, and they did a lot tail end of last year which I think is uh, is worth talking about. So um, that's what I'm going to do today. It's not going to be focused on a single song. Um, it's really going to talk about the Snack Time EP, the Freaks single that they did with Warren Hugh, and the, the Head in the Clouds concert, which they did in November in California, and the way that this is indicative of a, a, a new move towards the internationalization of their market. Before I get started, uh, as you may have noticed, I've started a Patreon page for people who want to support me making these videos and writing and various other things. I'll put the link in the description below, so please check that out. Also, keep your eyes open for books. Um, it's a great way to support what I do, just to buy one of my books. Okay, so um, let's start by going back in time a little bit to... Um, last summer, I guess, um, when uh, uh, A.G. Atarashi Gako released a single with Indonesian rapper Warren Hugh. Baby, I'm no good when you breathe. I love the energy of this. I love the way that it incorporated that they're working with another Asian artist. I think that, you know, what they're doing with this particular song is really cool and interesting because they are addressing their own unconventionality, right? That they, um, they are freaks in a sense. They're not a conventional Japanese idol type group uh, as, a, as a dance vocal group. They're, they're unconventional. They're sort of strange. They're sort of freakish. What's interesting, of course, is that they make their freakishness uh, a mark of their own power, and they do it by introducing this running motif of another kind of freakishness, which is the the, the sumo wrestler, um, and whose freakishness in conventional Western standards is about their physicality, their bulk, but it's also associated with power and, to a certain extent, with grace, right? So uh, we, we have this sort of standoff, this battle kind of situation between Atarashi Gako and the sumo uh, wrestlers in which the Atarashi Gako draw on these images from kind of manga and uh, Japanese popular movie culture in which the sort of little things, the yo-yos and the fans and stuff like that associated with uh, ordinary life, particularly with high school girls, uh, become uh, weapons, becomes symbols of their own power. And then, of course, because we're united in our freakishness, we're all sort of joined together in this sort of delightful, crazy uh, dance at, at the end. Um, and, and the fact that, that Warren Hugh is also singing in English and then uh, Atarashi Gako are sort of 
counterpointing what he's saying with their own sort of Japanese rap style version of it, you know, I think uh, is part of what makes the song approachable and fun. Um, and sort of, you know, I hesitate to, work, to use a word like universal, but I do think that there's a very broad applicability and we can see them sort of, again, I talked about this before, in some ways moving away from that very jazz heavy sound, which defined their first two albums, which I loved, you know, I, I, um, but as they move away from that and the music gets a little bit more simple, and, but it also becomes more direct more clearly current it's still hybrid it's still sort of weird uh, mishmash of, of different styles um, and sounds and i think it's part of what makes them really cool after freaks we got what became the first single off the snack time ep which is pineapple kryptonite the alien task force insists there is no present danger in Southern California desert area. And this is a fascinating little song, and there are various versions of the of the video. I'll include some of them in here because it, it came specifically out of their trip, I think, in March last year of 2021 to uh, California. I believe it's their, their first visit to the U.S. and certainly their first time working as a group together, living together, and and working on music. <laughs> And they were paired with Money Mark of the Beastie Boys, which is kind of extraordinary and fascinating of itself, right? It's a major figure in that sort of pop, hip hop uh, hybrid, which was so big, you know, um, in the 90s and into the first part of this century, you know, and has very distinctive sounds and, and, and a lot of attitude and a lot of youthful energy to it. What's also really interesting is that this really marks a departure for them, not only because they're now in the US and they're working in the US and they're clearly inspired by the US in terms of producing this and the rest of the Snack Time EP, but that they were making it themselves, right? In the, fir the first two albums, um, the, the vast amount of the, of the musical influence is coming from HZM or the Zetrio, um, which supplies that sort of very acid jazz kind of uh, feel to it. But here, they came in, it seems, with not very much at all, uh, and then built the various songs from the ground up themselves, working with a highly creative, highly knowledgeable producer in, in Money Mark, but working out songs on the guitars and on the various sort of keyboards and, and, and bits of things that he had around the house and generating their own lyric. Now, a lot of the of um, Pineapple Kryptonite is in English, um, so I'm, I'm sure they, they had some help with that, though a lot of the English is very Japanese English, you know? Uh, so the, there's a simpleness to it. it. It lends it a kind of a believability and authenticity. You think, yeah, th this is coming from them. And they've talked about the process by which they came up with the with the song. What's so uh, great about this group? What's so great about these girls? Uh, like, they're very unique and they're super talented in every way. Like, um, they can probably they can dance and sing and act. They're, they're like a triple threat, each one of them separately. Uh, but they're also very weird, and um, it's it's cool that young women are being, you know, like vulnerable like this, showing their like all sides of themselves. Um, and they're very smart, so um, I think that's the reason we got along. 
because I'm kind of weird and uh, kind of off in my own world sometimes. So. <laughs> I was like glad to be part of their, their mm -hmm. um, the whole world. I feel sort of like uh, the fifth Beatle here. This is one of those songs where even the even the single itself is a kind of hybrid. It's like two radically different songs that have been sort of fused together, and one of them is this goofy, um, playful, mostly Japanese uh, story about an alien, and this is also very California, right? Um, and the video shows us glimpses of Area 51 and Money Mark walking down the side of the road. Uh, the, the story is, you know, some sort of alien has crash landed here and poses a threat to world civilization and they have to, to battle the monster. Um, unsuccessfully until they discover that its weakness, its vulnerability, its kryptonite, as it were, is pineapple. The goofy storyline, uh, which generates all this sort of fun uh, choreography and, and energy to the song itself, is then uh, balanced with this quite lyrical, uh, sort of haunting, melodic piece in English. And, and you know, it's, I actually find it quite touching, you know, and there's a, there's a poignancy to it. I was going to say despite the goofiness of the surrounding song, but maybe it's somehow because of it, right? I think within the framework of the, of the, of the story, as it were, this sort of life and death struggle with the alien prompts this sense about what the purpose of life is and what we're supposed to do with life before it goes away. Where did the pineapple come from? Apparently Money Mark just brought it into the little sort of converted house studio where they were working because he didn't want to leave it in his car because it was hot. So he brought it in and it sort of sat there for a while and it became a sort of in-joke and then gradually it became part of the song, which is really interesting and, and tells you a lot about the way the snack time recordings seem to have worked because it's not so much about coming up with complex lyrical ideas for people like me to unpack um, and more a question of working with things spontaneously organically to generate sound you know um, and I was watching one particular video where they were talking about one of the other songs on the uh, on the album Fantastico uh, album it's an EP it's a five track EP and on the Fantastico song, which has a very sort of Italian disco kind of smooth dance kind of sound. Um, and they said the, you know, there's, the words are meaningless. I think Miju actually says, Imiga, Arimasa. There's no meaning, the words have no meaning. It's just a sort of katakanaized version of certain sort of Japanese sounds and foreign words mixed together but it doesn't apparently they say it doesn't actually mean anything it's just sound so it's reminiscent of something like Cocteau Twins or, or those kind of groups where uh, what they're creating is a kind of sound palette rather than um, meaning per se. I love that you know both visually and musically, you hear again that hybridity between the the American and the Japanese, right? That you know you, all that those those images of, of the American West, the, the landscape, the huge road, the big car, the, the the Area 51 stuff, the alien stuff, you know, the family camping out, you know, these are all very sort of iconic American images, the barbecue and so on, you know. But then you, you fuse it with this, um, with you know, Japanese weapons and this, this, the schoolgirls in uniform sort of uniting to, to, to battle the monster and save the world. But, but as I say, you, you can hear the, that hybridity, not just in the, in, the, in the look, but also in the music itself. That, that mixture of a sort of hip hoppy vibe with um, this sort of very sort of Showa era melodic. Uh, vocal, you know, 
in, in it, it's a song about intersection, a song about different, disparate things coming together and finding a kind of strength and power in that new form thing. And I think that's exactly what we're hearing. That's why I think it's cool. And I think it's really interesting that a lot of the choreography features something that Atarashi Gakko do a lot, which is fighting amongst themselves, often quite brutally, you know, um, because this is what their sort of youthful energy is about. It's about extremes. It's about this sort of intense feelings of love and hate and wanting to sort of live on the knife edge, as it were, you know, to experience things fully. And I think that's what the song's about. And also about ultimately trying to make the world a little bit better. How doesn't really matter. I think we know when we're making the world better and when we're making it worse. So yeah, so um, so Pineapple Kryptonite, I think, is, is a really fun song and a fascinating way to sort of say, America, here we are, you know? The second song on the EP is Free Your Mind. The video for this was built, uh, was made in Tokyo. They said it was it was very much inspired by being in California, by being in this sort of big, open, sunny uh, space in which there was a, a sense of of openness and freedom amongst the people and the the um, and the positivity of the vibe, the the environment, right? And I think in some of that that some of that is California, and some of that is also being Japanese in California. Um, I mean, in a way, I experienced it the other way around. When you go to a foreign culture where people don't know you, there's also a sense that you're not responsible to um, in the ways that you normally would be. It can be it's very liberating, right? The sense that that you're separate, you're different. That's particularly, I think, the case for them coming from Japan, where uh, for the most part, culture tends to be a little bit more low key, and people conduct themselves in in a a way that they're a, a conscious of the people around them, not wanting to hurt or offend or outrage them. And in Cal and you go to California and that kind of goes away and their sort of essential strangeness, their freakishness, if we refer to the previous <laughs> song, um, is more sort of accepted and more open and they take a kind of delight in that. And it's, you know, again, very light on meaning. It's an upbeat dancey kind of sort of um, uh, song about being positive and being um, uh, being happy. Now, I, I do think that, you know, if we're talking about the way that they are quite savvily and interestingly moving beyond a Japanese market into a U.S. market, it's really interesting that a song like this that, ex that comes out of their experience in California has also been released in a Spanish language version which is really unusual you know for a japanese band It seems to me that they are sort of deliberately carving out um, uh, a kind of uh, a global presence. And I, and I think, you know, also coming out of California at the moment, we're seeing bands like the Linda Lindas, which combine an Asian and Latina, who have a sort of punky aesthetic, which is which grows in part out of their own sort of cultural background. So I think it's interesting that, that Atarashi Gakko are now sort of also doing a kind of Spanish language kind of thing. I think one of the things that, that comes across really clearly in that is that while they manifest a kind of youthful energy, youthfulness 
and the things associated with it, the positive things associated with it, are something that they extend to everybody. It's not simply about being young and therefore cut off from everybody else. There's a communal spirit which includes everyone. So you see people of different generations and backgrounds, ages in particular, you know, throughout the video. And it's about using that spirit of innovation, subversion, all the things that, that make their sort of youthful presence um, what it is. But sharing that with everybody as a sort of a common unifier um, that, that, you know, escaping sort of predictable humdrum existence is something that can happen at any age, which as an old guy, I particularly appreciate. But I love that as, as they're getting older, their notion of themselves as ambassadors for youth is more a kind of mental state than it is simply a physical age. And I think that's one of the things that makes it interesting. And it's why the uniform continues to make sense, even as they cease to be high school age. It's fun, right? It's just, it, it's upbeat, it's energetic, it's positive. Uh, and it has, again, that, you know, it, it's a very sort of electronic sound, but that sort of distorted guitar gives it that little sort of punky push, you know. Nice. By contrast, the uh, next song is Candy, which is a very sort of techno song. Um, and uh, again, light on meaning and playfulness. And the last song uh, on, the, on the EP is called Happy Hormones. Electronica, there's something really cool about coming to this last song, which has this sort of almost hippie kind of vibe. There's a mellowness to it, an easygoing, um, pleasant, ambient kind of sound with that funky bass. It's got an edge of soul. There's even a sort of little homage to previous soul artists, like uh, somebody like Terence Trent Darby in that little keyboard hook. <laughs> But, but also, you know, it's a song, this has a, a little more content to it than, than Candy does, which is mostly just sort of sound and, and, and onomatopoeia and even the word, what few words there are in Candy have been sort of, you know, modified by the, the processing so that they, they don't actually function as words anymore, right? So that aka, aka, aka sound is, is just, is, is a corruption of baka, you know? Uh, which is the result of the processing. But this, by contrast, has this sort of beautiful melodic voice that comes in over the top of all that synthesized stuff. This sort of general idea about the pursuit of happiness by sort of being open-hearted and, and good to each other and not destroying the planet in the process. And what, what, what I particularly love about it is that even as they're doing this, it's, you know, this it's a nice idea, but it's a familiar idea. And it gets, you know, it could get close to, to platitude, to a kind of familiar piety. Except, of course, that the lead vocal gets it wrong, that Suzuka is singing about how she wants carbon dioxide. And the backing vocal has to say, no, idiot, that's not what we want. We need oxygen. And they're like, OK, yeah, I made a mistake. <laughs> So even in this sort of appeal to for the things that, that make life good, there's a sort of self-conscious undercutting that, that, that we're asking for the wrong thing. I love this. It's so good. And likewise, the way that they're, they're punning on the word hormones, meaning a kind of uh, barbecue. It, it fits the overall EP that there's a, a tongue-in-cheek playfulness Throughout. It never allows itself to be taken too seriously, which I think is cool. It's 
it's interesting that you know that, that they've gone out of their way to sort of do official lyric videos in English, so that when they're not um, singing in Japanese, that there's a, a deliberate attempt to sort of make that connection with the with the audience. And I think we saw that particularly in their uh, the the '88 Rising concert, the Head in the Clouds concert, which they managed to squeeze in deftly between Delta and Omicron in California in November. Um, and this was their first US show. And it's kind of beautiful to watch. I didn't quite know what to expect. I didn't know what the audience would make of them. This was a big sort of festival kind of thing, a lot of Asian acts, and uh, and they were the first on. Um, and they seemed really up for it, excited, they were having fun, um, and the audience, so far as I could tell, loved them. And the concert featured classic Atarashi Gako goofiness, you know, including the sort of taiko drum stuff at the beginning, which apparently was programmed by Rin. You know, obviously there would be people who already knew them, but I think they won a lot of people over as well. And it led to some sort of slightly odd things. I mean, in terms of them getting very positively reviewed by unpredictable sources like National Public Radio, which I didn't see coming, you know. But I think it's indicative of the idea that a number of people are watching them as an emerging act. It also used some of the sort of iconic songs off the first couple of albums, um, Koi Geba particularly, it's a great song. In the course of that concert, they also somewhat astonishingly to me, did a, a cover, a Japanese cover of the Beastie Boys Intergalactic. Obviously, this is through working with Money Mark. Um, and I think it's, it's a really interesting choice that they are sort of aligning themselves with uh, a, a, such an iconic band, which was itself a sort of hybrid subversion of a number of different musical forms. <laughs> I mean, how cool is that to do? A, I mean, and it's brave, it's risky to do a cover of like an iconic song like that and to introduce themselves as saying, you know, the Beastie Boys were with the Beastie Girls. This group of, of Japanese women coming in and saying, we're going to we're going to take this stuff on. Right. We're, we're making it our own. I love that. I, I love that. The 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 ambition and the. The, the, the chutzpah of it, the, the courage of it, and uh, 
and, and saying we're, we're putting ourselves out there and we're going to do the same kind of thing, but in our own way, and we're going to make it our own. I love that. It's so great. Now, it's fascinating that they used some backing dancers, local Asian based dance group from California. Again, there's that sense of bridge. And interestingly, also the backing dancers, though they are all wearing the same school uniform uh, as Atarashi Gako, were both female and male, which is interesting of itself. And it makes you think, you know, what are they doing with this uniform thing? Because uh, they're clearly not getting rid of it. They're holding on to it. But I think this sense of them as ambassadors of Japanese youth culture is sort of turning the, the, the conventional ideas about school uniform upside down. You know, that they are using it not simply as a badge of their, their Japanese-ness, as it were, but in terms of an, an inversion of something that makes everybody the same. And they are now using it as a kind of uniform of a global movement, which is all about individual tastes and choices, personal struggles, and standing out from the crowd, right? Which is their sort of mantra. And it's interesting that, you know, uh, seeing some of the, the male dancers wearing the Atarashi Gako school uniform uh, is reminiscent of that um, band that I mentioned before when I was talking about the 999 uh, video and its connections to various other Japanese punk artists. And I was specifically referring them to uh, Sakuran Zensen, and who, whose lead singer also will wear the, the girl sailor suit. <laughs> So it's interesting because it seems like the this is again it's a subversive uh, way of of deconstructing or reclassifying issues of personal identity in terms of race and sexuality and gender and sexual orientation and all those kind of things but also you know this sort of full-on high energy dance performance of songs like pineapple kryptonite which clearly you know sort of wowed the audience and they were just having so much fun it was such a such a great thing to watch you know um it's one of those things that just makes me think man i really hope it works out for them i know they've been around for a while now for what seven years i guess um but i feel like they're on that sort of tipping point where they're they're going to break out and, and become uh, a bigger act. Now, th that said, I think I don't think that they're pursuing some sort of mainstream dominance. I don't think that's the issue. I think there's something very savvy going on here, which recognizes the musical landscape, the larger cultural landscape, as something which is increasingly fragmented. I think I may have said this before, but I'm increasingly convinced that mainstream music, mainstream culture, is a 20th century phenomenon. It required a certain technology to get us there and to share this very widely. But I think as the technology has changed, as we've moved into to the internet age, that sense of megastar, uh, you know, the people who everybody's aware of, everybody's watching the certain movies, TV shows, everybody's reading certain kinds of certain books, everybody's listening to music by certain artists. I think that's all going away. And what we're going to have in place of it is more smaller niche markets. And I'm not just talking about music. I'm talking about books and TV shows and movies and everything. I think that's the future. And there are pros and cons to that, of course. You know, maybe, maybe we'll lose something when we're increasingly disconnected as a, as a, a culture. But I think it's kind of recognizing what already exists. And I think it means that the doors are opening for more kinds of music in this case 
that don't fit the usual cookie cutter model. Bands that are going to get rejected by the by big record labels because you're not going to sell millions of records. It's like, well, that doesn't. Nobody's going to sell millions of records like, like they used to. There will not be another Beatles. There will not be another Elvis. You know, think how many of the really, really megastar artists at the moment made their names 15 years ago. You know, I don't know if we're going to have those kind of huge celebrity. Uh, musicians in the future. I think we're going to have more and more mid-level, you know, and we'll find our little niches through our Spotify or whatever, you know. Um, and the, uh, the mammals will rise up from between the feet of the dinosaurs. There's a metaphor. <laughs> Atarashi Gakko scurrying out from underneath the feet of the T-Rexes just as the asteroid comes down. Maybe. So yeah, I'm I'm excited by these guys. I I I love to watch them because of that sort of their their energy and their optimism and their positivity. It's not a blind optimism because a lot of their stuff has a lot of conflict in it. Um, but this sort of determined desire to be positive, you know and to be creative and innovative and hybrid, all these things that I really like, you know? So I, I, I hope that we're seeing, you know, the beginning of really great things for them and uh, I will continue to cheer for them. And that's all I've got to say. So thank you as ever, please like, comment, subscribe, check out my Patreon page, consider buying a book, you know, not, they're not expensive. Thanks for watching. Particular thanks to the people who have already started getting my Patreon thing going to Stephen, Len, Jeff, and WS. Thank you guys. I really appreciate it. Till next time.